Mystery Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting story about his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. As for me, instead of telling you something, I- I'd like to ask you something. Do you like chicken? How do you like it best? Roasted, fried, or in a stew with dumplings? Well, whatever your favorite may be, you like that chicken infinitely better when it's served with a glass of Petri California Sauterne. Ah, now there's a combination. Chicken and Petri Sauterne. Petri Sauterne is a white wine, pale golden in color, delicately fragrant, and clear as crystal. And what a flavor that Petri Sauterne has. I'm telling you, Petri Sauterne is just about the last word in dinner wine. Oh, one more tip. Remember to serve Petri Sauterne with fish or any kind of seafood. Good, it's great. To be sure you have a glass of good wine, be sure it's Petri wine. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's go in and join him. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartow. Punctual to the minute, as usual. Drop a chair and settle down, my boy. Well, I won't settle down too far, Doctor. You have a habit of keeping me on the edge of my chair during most of your stories. Uh, yes, this should be, Mr. Bartow. I hope tonight will prove no exception, so light up your pipe and I'll get on with my story. Doctor, from the hint you gave us last week, it sounded like quite a thriller. How did it begin? On a cold winter morning in 1897... Holmes and I, our breakfast just concluded, sat on either side of a cheery fire in our Baker Street lodging. A thick fog rolled down between the line of dun-colored houses, and the opposite windows loomed like dark, shapeless blurs with a heavy yellow wreath. Another London pea super, huh, Doctor? Exactly, Mr. Bartell. Our gas was lit and shone its flicking light on the white cloth and glimmer of china, for the breakfast table had not been cleared. Holmes was busy cross-indexing his record of crime, while I was engrossed in one of Clark Russell's fine sea stories. Our morning was not destined, however, to be a quiet one. But shortly after 11 o'clock, Mrs. Hudson ushered a young lady into our room. A young lady... Who seemed to be in serious uh, Down, won't you, young lady? I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Watson, and, and this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, gentlemen? I must apologize for not giving my name to your housekeeper. But I have to be so careful. This is something you would quite understand, my dear. Of course, you're wondering who I am and what's brought me here. My own theory would be that you are Miss Harriet Irving. And that you've come to me to elicit my aid in proving that Mr. Binion did not murder your father. Holmes, what on earth are you talking about? You're absolutely correct, Mr. Holmes. But huh? how did you know? I deduced it, Miss Irving. You're wearing very new and extremely expensive mourning. Presumably for the first time, since a few basting threads are still in evidence. You wear no rings, so evidently you're not in mourning for a husband... The only man whose death the papers announced in the past few days and who left a young daughter uh, wealthy enough to purchase such garments is Sir Edward Irving. And since the police have already made an arrest, obviously wish me to uh, uh, disprove the police theory and intercede for young Binion. Mr. Holmes, you're wonderful. That's just what I want you to do. You will, won't you? Uh, Miss Irving, I've studied the newspaper reports very carefully. It would seem to me that Scotland Yard has uh, arrested the right man. Well, I'm really sorry, but I didn't read the newspaper reports. I have the faintest idea what you're both talking about. Then uh, let me bring you up to date, my dear fellow. Mm-hmm. And please mm-hmm. correct me, Miss Irvin, if I make any mistakes. Now, three days ago, Sir Edward Irvin, the father of this young lady, was found stabbed to death in his study. Oh, the only entrance oh, to the study is through an anteroom, where his secretary had been sitting ever since Sir Edward was last seen alive. And the secretary swore that no one had entered or left the study. The secretary's name being uh, Binion, I suppose. Yes, under the circumstances, it's hard to see that any other arrest was possible. And yet I know he's innocent, Mr. Holmes. Oh, and how do you know? Know that, Miss We were in love. We were going to be married. I don't care what the police say. A woman knows these things. Robert Binion did not kill my father. Did your father approve of the engagement? Well, no. Not exactly. If one were to be exact, Miss Evan, wouldn't one say that uh, your father absolutely forbade the marriage? Yes, he did. And Inspector Lestrade assumed that was the motive for the murder. Well... Sounds logical, I must say. Does your father have any other relatives living, Miss Irvin? His brother, my uncle Peregrine, 
Uh, he lives a hermit's life in the country. We've seen very little of him in the last few years. Was he left anything under your father's will? No, I was the sole beneficiary. Please help me, Mr. Holmes. If you'll just talk to Robert, you'll know he's not guilty. Oh, there's no harm in talking to him, Holmes. After all, our old friend Lestard handled the case, and he's made a good many mistakes in the past. Oh, well, haven't we all, old chap? <laughs> well, Miss Evans, I'll do what I can, but I promise nothing. Yes, you, Mr. Uh, where is your fiancé being held? At Scotland Yard. I talked to him there just before I came to Scotland you. Scotland Yard, eh? Splendid. Yeah. We can talk to the stars at the same time. Watson, your hat... My hat and coat? Uh, precisely, old fellow, your hat and coat. So, <laughs> Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson... Think they know more than the yard, eh? <laughs> Come over here to teach us our business, I suppose. There's nothing of the sort, Mr. Stard. We came over here to make a few inquiries. I'll tell you, gentlemen, that you're wasting your time. Young Binion is guilty, whatever his young lady may say. Mr. Stard? Yes, Mr. Strong? Uh, what did the autopsy prove? Well, I've got a report of it here on my desk, but uh, it won't tell you nothing you don't know. Mm -hmm. Death was instantaneous. Caused by some weapon like a long needle, a fine stiletto, or an ice pick. Penetrating the brain at the base of the skull. And no such weapon was found in the room. Or on Mr. Binion. True, sir. But then he had the chance of disposing of it. Well, just the same, the murder weapon hasn't been found, has it? No, Doctor, but we'll find it. Don't you worry about that. I should like to talk to the prisoner, if you don't mind. Well, of course I don't mind. He's in the uh, detention cell just down the corridors from here. Uh, follow me, gentlemen. Has he given you any trouble, Lestat? Trouble? <laughs> if all our prisoners were as quiet as him, we wouldn't need no guards, Doctor. Nice, quiet young fellow. Hard to realize he's a murderer. The fact that still has to be proven in court, Lestat. A fact that is going to be proved in court, Mr. Holmes. Well, here we are at his cell. You've uh, got visitors, Binion. Very distinguished visitors. Hello, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Holmes, Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. I'm sorry to see you in this fight, Mr. Binion. Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Then Harriet did come and see you when she left here. I'm so glad. You'll get me out of this mess. I know you will. Even Mr. Sherlock Holmes can't get you out of this one, young fellow. Mr. Binion, I promised your fiancé that I'd try and help you. My obvious course is to go to Sir Edward's house and examine the room in which the tragedy occurred. But before I do that, I'd like to ask you a question or two. Ask me any question you want to, sir. It was you who discovered the body, I understand. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Please describe the circumstances. Sir Edward was in his study. I'd been working in the anteroom adjoining. At five o'clock, I went in to say good night to him, and I found him slumped in his chair, dead, with blood streaming down the back of his head. Of course, I sent the butler for the police at once. Could anyone have entered that room without your knowledge? No, Mr. Holmes, I never left my desk. And there was no other entrance to the room, save through my office. Well, how about the windows in Sedmont's room? They were locked from the inside, Doctor. Oh, you don't need to worry. We examined the window ledges, not a mark. No one came in that way. Now, what is your theory of the murder, Mr. Binion? I haven't one, Mr. Holmes. I'm completely baffled. I'm certain that no one entered that room. Yet I swear to you that I didn't stab him. So I can understand the police believing I did. Mm -hmm. From the start, I should like to examine the room in which Sir Edward was murdered. Well, easiest thing in the world, Mr. Holmes. I'll drive over with you, if you like. His house is in night. Oh, you needn't bother, Lestard. We can, we can quite well go by ourselves. Oh, eh? not a bit of it, Doctor. I'd like to come with you. Oh, oh why, Lestard? You're, you're convinced Mr. Binion is guilty, are you? Well, won't you, uh, won't you be wasting your time? Not me. <laughs> For once I know you're on the wrong side of a case, Mr. Holmes. And I want to be there and see your faces when you find it out. This is the house, Mr. Holmes. Yes, imposing looking place, I must say. I imagine, Mr. Star, that you still have a police guard inside. Oh, yes, Doctor. There's been a sergeant guarding the dead man's room day and night. Uh, we uh, still haven't found the missing weapon, you know. Yes, gentlemen? I'm Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard. We uh, wish to examine the house. I must see your identification, sir. What are you talking about? I've been in and out of this house half a dozen times. I have my orders, sir. 
Oh, very well. Is Miss Irvin at home? Miss Irvin is not receiving, sir. Great Scott, man, can't you give us any information? There's been tragedy in this house, sir, and the truth of it's not known yet. I'm not answering any questions, but I don't have to. Yeah. Here now, does this uh, police guard satisfy you? Hmm. Inspector Lestrade. Very good, Inspector. You may uh-huh. come in. Uh-huh. May I direct you, gentlemen? No, thank you. I know this house nearly as well as you do. I think not, Inspector. I've served here for 27 years. Now, well, gentlemen, if you're not needing me, I'll return to my quarters. Bless my soul. That's the sinister-looking chap if I ever saw one. Yes, and he knows something. <laughs> you see, Lestrade, there is a possibility that Binion is innocent. Yes, sir. I began to see that, sir, when you were talking to the butler. You're being very cryptic. What other possibility are you talking about? The possibility is that Dinian, the arrested man, is shielding the real murderer. And whom would he be most certain to shield? You mean his fiancée, Miss, Miss Irvin? That's right, old fellow. What? Huh. Here we are. Uh, this is the ante room where young Dinian worked. And that door there leads into the study where Sir Edward was found. Now, they've been touched, of course, since the discovery of the crime. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. Uh, that's why we've had a constable on duty in there night and day. Uh, before the trial, we're bringing experts in to uh, test the room for secret panels or anything of that kind. Let's examine the dead man's room, shall we? Oh, right you are, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Webster. Webster, get out of that chair and stand up, can't you? You're on duty. Asleep. Scott, he's dead. Yes. The trickle of blood oozing out from the base of his skull. Well, strike me pink. He's been killed the same way as Sir Edward was. I presume you'll agree that Mr. Binion didn't commit this murder, Lestrade. Well, of course not, Mr. Holmes. He couldn't have done it. He's locked up at the yard. Well, what are we going to do? Ask the butler to come here, will you? Oh, well, right you are, sir. Uh, what do you make of their wound, Doctor? Well, it's a fit the description of the one that killed Sir Edward. There's a fine puncture here at the, the base of the skull. How do you Holmes? They mentioned a stiletto or an ice pick. A wound like this might be caused by one of those long steel hat pins that, that women wear. Yes, it's a possibility, Watson. A distinct possibility. And Miss Irvin was wearing a long hat pin this morning, if you remember. Uh-huh. Bastard walls. A little chance of secret panels here, I should say. And the window's locked from the inside, eh? Yeah. Here he is, Mr. Holmes. Oh, yes, sir. And by the way, what's your name? Trevor, sir. You see what's happened, Trevor? Yes, sir. I've seen. The constable's been killed just like my master. Now, tell me, Trevor, is this room exactly as it was in Sir Edward's lifetime? Yes, sir. Except that my master was not in the habit of keeping the corpses of policemen in here. Yeah, oh. Don't try to be funny, Trevor. Don't you realize you're mixed up in a murder case? I meant no offense, gentlemen. Uh, marks in the bad taste, my good fellow. The point of my question, Trevor, was to find out if any of the furniture in here had been moved lately. Not moved, sir. But there has been a piece of furniture added. That armchair the dead man's lying in. The same chair in which Sir Edward's body was found. Of course, that's the answer. Trevor, when was that chair delivered? And who delivered it? It was delivered the day before Sir Edward died. It came from Silver Schwartz's antique shop in Bonds. Uh Aha, sir. That came's a foot, Lestrade. See to the removal of this poor man's body. Seal the room, and for heaven's sake, keep this latest death a secret for a day at least. Within that time, I hope to have your murderer for you. Then we're going... We're going, my dear chap, to Silver Schwartz's antique shop in Bond Street. Those old music boxes are quite charming, Holmes, aren't they? Yes, but where's Mr. Silberschwanz? This is probably him. What a fine-looking old fellow. Oh, Mr. Silberschwanz. Yes, gentlemen. You are interested in musical boxes? No, sir, in chairs. Particularly in the handsomely carved chair you delivered to Sir Edward Irvin a few days ago. Ah, yeah, a magnificent specimen. He's pleased with it. He was found dead in it, Mr. Silberschwanz. And half an hour ago, someone else was found dead in it also. That chair was one of a pair, wasn't it? Yeah, but... Fully forgotten, Himmel. That's impossible. Please, please, to follow me. I, I will show you it's not possible. Look, look at the chair. It's exactly like the same one as uh, Sir Edward's house. Oh, my friend, but there's such a difference. Fifteenth-century Italian, isn't it? Yeah, this is one of a pair of the famous Malipiero armchairs. 
There are only three pairs in the world, my friend. Of this pair, one, the one I delivered to Sir Edward, is simply a great specimen of the carver's art. This one, it's made. Looks exactly like it, does it not? Exactly. I can't see any difference, so. You would if you sat in it, old chap. Precisely. That is why I have these cords stretched from one arm of the chair to the other. If anyone were to, to sit in it well, sometimes nothing will happen. But sooner or later, a hand will press on this hidden spring in the arm here, and death will strike. But nothing happened when you pressed the spring then, Mr. Silverstone? No, I, I, I don't understand. I do. This is the harmless chair. The lethal one was sent to Sir Edward. He sat in it, accidentally pressed the spring and drove the fatal needle into his brain. Yes, as that poor constable did today. Sir Edward bought both chairs, I presume? Yeah, I would not sell it. No, it's a pair uh, separately. Then why didn't you deliver both at the same time? He, he was afraid of the deadly one. Huh? He asked me to, huh? to keep it here until he found a safe place for it in his home. Mm-hmm. And some devil switched the arm cord from the fatal chair to the harmless one so that you delivered death to Sir Edward. That is a subtlety in this crime worthy of the fiendish maker of the chairs himself. So this once. Yeah, my name. Didn't Malapieri die of being tricked into seating himself in one of his own chairs? Yeah, yeah, he uh-huh. did. Ah, poetic justice. I'm much obliged to you, so the Schwartz. Now I think I know how to trap our killer. Dr. Watson will bring you the rest of his story in just a second, so I'm just going to tell you that after a good dinner, there's nothing quite like a glass of good Petri California port. Petri port is really a wonderful wine. A deep, hearty red in color and rich and truly delicious in flavor. You know, port wine is actually America's favorite wine. Try a glass of Petri Port, and you'll know why. Petri Port is not only fine after dinner, it's perfect whenever good friends get together. Just keep in mind the name Petri, because Petri wines are good wines. Well, Dr. Watson, this is quite a story you're telling us tonight. So you found out how the murders had been committed, but... Not who'd been responsible for it. That's quite right, Mr. Bartell. Holmes spent a long time cross-examining Mr. Silverswans, the owner of the antique store, as to who might have had the opportunity of switching the telltale cord from the fatal chair. And who did have that opportunity, well, Doctor? Well, Mr. Bartell, it transpired that four people might have been responsible. Sir Edward's daughter, the secretary, Mr. Binion, had both been in the shop with him at various times. So had the butler, Trevors. The fourth suspect was Sir Edward's eccentric brother, Peregrine who it appeared had dropped into the shop the day after the purchase had been made. With this last information, Holmes became very excited and launched into eager preparations, which ended a few hours later when we found ourselves disguised as furniture removers, driving a van along a quiet country lane near Dorking as we approached the house of Sir Edward's brother, Peregrine. There's the house, Watson. Ramshackle-looking place, isn't it? Yes, extremely so. <laughs> Why are you so morose, my dear chap? You've hardly spoken a word on our drive well, down never here. never tell me anything. Why are we trundling off into the wilds of the country disguised as furniture removers and carrying the harmless chair with us? Surely the reason is transparent, old chap? Yes, it's just about as transparent as dust stocking full of hot tripe. <laughs> my dear Watson, surely it's obvious that we're up against an extremely cunning murderer. Now, what advantage accrues to him in using the Malapiero chair? An alibi, of course. He's nowhere near the place where the murder happens. Precisely. Apply your logic a little further. Three of the suspects, the daughter, Mr. Binion, and Ferrers, the butler, live in the house and would almost certainly have been present at the time of death. Therefore, who gains most by such an alibi? Well, the the brother, Peregrine. Elementary, my dear Watson. Now you see why we trundled off into the wilds of Dorking. Well, that must be Peregrine standing up at the porch. He sees a funny-looking fella. Oh, my lead, Watson. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Uh, you uh, fellows must have come to the wrong house. Uh, you were uh, Mr. Pettigrine Irvine, aren't you, Governor? Yes. And we come to the right house. All right, all right, all right. Come on, Bertie, give us a hand. Uh, right you are, our feet. Well, what, what the devil? Go you unloading an armchair? Come on, get out of there, Charlie. You drop it on my foot, Bertie. Look at it. Easy does it. Come on, Bert. That's I right. Got it, Alf. I got it. All right. Set her down easy now on the porch here. There, there you go. go. That's it. Ah. Give me a cricket. I had a pretty chair, Governor. Bertie and me was admiring it on our way down here. Cool, blimey. It isn't half a nice chair. Yeah, but who told you to bring it here? Orders, Governor. This just silver snitch. What well, whatever his name is. <laughs> Tell us your brother didn't want the chair and said as how uh, we was to bring it to you. But my brother's dead. Mr. Silver Snitch said uh, he, he gave the order before he died. Why don't I sit down in it, Governor? Oh, well, of course not, of course not. Cool, lummy. 
<laughs> Bit of all right, isn't it? <laughs> Look at him laughing. <laughs> Who wished me old Trouble and Strife could see me now? Trouble and Strife? Yeah, yeah. Trouble and Strife, that's my wife, Governor. Here, sit down yourself, sir. Come on, go on, sit down, try it. Go on, go on, Governor. Take the weight off your plates of meat. Well, what barbaric jargon do you speak? What on earth are plates of meat? Plates of meat is feet, Governor. That's rhyming slang. That's right, that's right, rhyming slang. Go on, sit down in it. Go on. Oh, I'd be well. Oh. There, there now. There. Ain't that comfortable? Yeah, there. Go on. Run your hands over the arms, Governor. Ain't that carving pretty? Ain't it just ducky? Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, it is, but... But I don't want the wretched thing. There's been some mistake. Uh, so you'd better take it back to London and tell them to sell it. I, I don't want anything of my brother. Jumping Josephette. Can't see where you don't want to sit in a nice chair like this, Governor. But you, you're the one that's given the orders around here. Come on, Bertie. Come on, get your bag into it. Eh, all right, I'll Let's get back in the van. All right, yeah, come on. Away we go. Well, oh, oh, bless you, Rob, Governor. We don't worry about that sort of thing, do we, Bertie? Of course not, Alfie. <laughs> we had a nice drive in the country anyhow, didn't we? That's right. Now let's get these old horses going. Good day, Governor. Uh, good day, day Governor. Good. That was a false trail, Holmes. Obviously, you knew nothing about the chair. He thought it was perfectly harmless. And, uh, as indeed it was, that the murderer were the forty people. I had slipped up in my reasoning somehow. Hunt, hunt. Oh, but of course! Oh, what a fool I am! We must get back to London as fast as these tired nags can take us. Come on, get up there! Get up! Well, what's the next move, Holmes? Back to Edward's house, and the staging of a little drama that I'm sure will give us the final answer to this problem. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Holmes, I've got Miss Irving, young Binion, and the butler waiting outside. And, and no one knows we switched the chair. Splendid. Uh, you're sure that this is the harmless chair, yes, Holmes? Of course I am. Look here. I sit in it. So, run my hands over the arms. Yes, this chair is harmless, as every person save one will know. Show them in, Lestrade. All at once, Mr. Holmes? Uh, no, I think we'll take Miss Irving and Mr. Binion first. Well, right you are, sir. Uh, Miss Irvin, uh, Mr. Binion, uh, come in, please. Yes, sir. Very well. Oh, Mr. Holmes. What's the matter, Miss Irvin? It's just so horrible seeing you there in the same chair when I saw Father. Oh, Mr. Holmes, it's a trifle too macabre for you to assume the position of the corpse. Please get up. But it seems to be the most comfortable chair in the room, and I do like my comfort when I interrogate witnesses. However, it's hardly chivalrous, is it? Uh, Miss Irvin, please sit down, won't you? I, I, I don't like to sit down in the chair in which Father oh, died. Oh, Miss Irvin, we couldn't bear to see you standing. Very well, then. But don't sit down, Harry. Why not, Binion? What's the matter? Isn't the chair safe? No, no. It's then not perhaps you care to sit in it. To prove that the chair is safe. No, no, I... Sit I, down. I... Very well. There. Splendid. Curious chair, isn't it, Mr. Binion? I wonder about these carvings on the arms. They look almost as if they might activate concealed springs. I wonder what would happen if I... No, for heaven's sake, Mr. Holmes, you're trying to kill me. Kill you? Then you know how Sir Edward and the policeman were murdered, eh? I, I, I knew it must have something to do with the chair. You knew more than that, Robert. You planned it. I remember now that when we went to the shop, Keep you... Quiet, Harry! Come back here, you! No, 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 Watson, don't go after them. The start will stop him. In any case, the police are at the door. Oh, 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 I'm tired. I think I'll sit in this rather fateful armchair. So it was young Binion all the time, eh? Yes, and he all but outsmarted me. I reasoned that somehow the murderer must have intended the device of this chair to clear him. And suddenly I saw the real motivation. How better establish his innocence than seeming to be obviously guilty, and yet leaving a trail whereby an astute deduction could seem to clear him. Yes, it's his idea that Mr. Irvin came to you. He used you as a, as a cat's ball. Oh, that's right, Watson. I'm afraid this whole case is a rather humiliating experience oh, for me. Why, why do you well, say the that? the guard had arrested the right man in the first place. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, my dear Watson, I shall never hear the end of this. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, that was a swell story. 
<laughs> Imagine Lestrade accidentally arresting the right man. Well, he had that one coming to him. Poor fellow, he'd been outwitted by Holmes so many times he was beginning to get an inferiority complaint. <laughs> what about Miss Irvin? How did she take it when her boyfriend, Binion, has proved guilty? Well, when she realized that her sweetheart had actually murdered her father, as they say in the penny thrillers, her love turned to hate. But at first, she, she took it pretty bad. I can imagine so. Mr. Bartell, my boy... That's one of the disadvantages of being a detective. When you bring the guilty to justice, you very often cause the innocent to suffer too. Believe me, never become a detective. Stick to being a, a wine expert. You're calling me a wine expert? Oh. Now, wait a minute, Doctor. All I know about wine is that it either tastes good or it doesn't. <laughs> and I know that Petri wine always does taste good. And I know why, too. It's because the Petri family has been making wine for generations. The art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine is their heritage. A heritage handed down within the Petri family from father to son, from father to son. What particular type wine you prefer is, of course, a matter of your personal taste. But let me assure you of this. Whatever type wine you desire, for any occasion, you can depend on any wine that bears the Petri label. Petri took time to bring you good wine. And today, that name Petri is the proudest name in the long history of America's wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes adventure are you planning to tell us next week? Next week, Mr. Bartell. Now, let me see. Next week. Next week, I'm going to tell you a strange story that took place in one of the smaller states of Middle Europe. It concerns a young prince, a most unusual concert, and a beautiful contralto who sang two days after we'd seen her die at the hands of the firing squad. I call the story The Haunting of Sherlock Holmes. Doctor, that's one I've got to listen to. Uh, yes, Mr. Bartell. And everyone should also listen to what Secretary of Agriculture Anderson says about saving used kitchen fat. We've all got to keep turning in every bit of used fat. Take it to your meat dealer. The shortage of fat is worse now than ever it was. And unless we help, and we all help, we'll all be faced with a serious shortage of soap. Yes, and a serious shortage of paint lubricating oils, drugs, and many other things that require fat in their manufacture. It's up to us to keep turning in every bit of used kitchen fat. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Bulger and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Musgrove Ritual. Music is by Dean Paltzler. Mr. Rathbone appears with the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>